Do you remember when we met? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. We met the night of your show. Ah! I was sitting with Tarana Burr yeah. and had the, I was like just bonding with her and I was so happy to be sitting with her. And then at the end of the show, I came backstage and I gave you the biggest hug yeah, and I no, was like, no. I've known you forever and ever. <laughs> and it was really wonderful. I mean, I also just really appreciate you because you're just so vocal and so supportive and you're like, about making sure that people know what's going on and also like what we can do mm -hmm. about certain yeah. things that are happening in the world and just how to be of service to our own communities and so that was something that like I, I feel like it was just like love at first yeah. sight. I felt like I know you and I was like oh my you god. You built community. Yeah and, and when I was like reading about you and, and all the stuff that you do and everything I was just like man like and I want to be friends with her you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, so happy that yeah. happened. Talking about like you know um, hijab and you know like how you present yourself mm. and so you've talked about it gives you strength and power my experience with hijab was a part of my journey in finding myself mm -hmm. i grew up in a very conservative small white town there weren't any muslims around yeah. and so my mom who started wearing hijab at 23 after i was born so i was born in west virginia lived in alabama grew up in southern maryland um and <laughs> yeah. I struggled a lot with my identity because I had never seen people who looked like me and the only person that I could see were the people in my family. And hijab has to be a choice. Yeah. So my parents never really talked to me about it or mentioned it. Um, but I, they knew all, like from this high that I was going to be a journalist or a reporter yeah. before I even knew what the term was. I like was obsessed with Oprah and I loved yeah. asking questions and telling yeah, yeah, where yeah. everybody was yeah, right yeah. and that was something that was so innate in me yeah. it was so natural to me and so I just they knew that that was going to happen but to me growing up I had never seen anybody with a hijab on yeah. American television and mm -hmm. so my understanding was that you obviously have to look just like the people on TV mm -hmm. to be like the people on <laughs> TV because otherwise why else would there be such a lack of diversity yeah and as a kid, I internalized that. Mm -hmm. And so like to the point where like, when I got to high school, I was dyeing my hair blonde and yeah. wearing colored contacts yeah. because I thought that's how I had to look. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until we moved out of that town and I like, we moved right outside of Washington DC where I really tried to come to terms with my identity. Uh -huh. And when I realized that like my mom, who Michelle is just like so strong and courageous and brave and un unapologetic in who she is, yeah. Um, and then my younger sister at the time, who was 12, she decided to put on the hijab. And I was at like, 12. wait, what? Yeah, she oh, put wow. it on at 12. And my parents were like, um, are you sure you want to be doing that? Um, oh, wow. And I was like, what is it about this thing that makes people so strong? So I put it on kind of impulsively in a p place where I was like really struggling. And I realized later that I think that any way of putting on your identity or, or finding yourself and being your your most authentic self, um, you're never ready for it. Mm -hmm. You're never like, I've gotten to a point of, like a pinnacle of righteousness and piety and I've done all of these things to get to this point. No, putting on yourself means putting it on in a time where you're broken and you're struggling and you're trying so hard to find yourself because in that darkness is the light. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I was like, maybe this is it for me. And I put it on and Nobody in my family like thought I was gonna keep it on, and mm -hmm. I found out like I found this out kind of later. Um, they all thought I was gonna take it off. They're all like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But when my mom saw that I put it on, she was like, hey, if you still really want to accomplish this dream of being on television, then why don't you um, homeschool the rest of your high school and start college early? So mm -hmm. I call I started college at 16 so I could get a head start in my career. Okay. And I realized well. that in order for me to be able to do this, I had to be the best journalist possible. Yeah. I had to be as confident as I possibly could, even if I didn't feel it on the inside. I had to be that person for everybody who came before me yeah. and everybody who was coming after me. What was the reaction from your friends and like the families? Obviously, they saw yeah, you. Yeah, that's such a great question yeah. um, because, oh, I've never like really thought about it out loud, but it was definitely a transition. So when I started putting it on. Everybody that I grew up with, that I stayed in touch with, mm -hmm. like I just, they fell off. Like they, I realized that a lot of wow. them didn't come around. They didn't understand it. Um, Did they ask you? No, and, and now as an adult, more of an adult, I realized that people don't ask because they don't know how to ask or they feel like they, 
they're scared to ask out of ignorance. And that, yeah. that we live in that today, which is why, like I always say, please, please, please ask yeah. me every single question. I, I You'll never, same. if you ask me, you don't offend yeah. me. If you ask with love, you know, ask, if you ask with empathy, love, and interest. But if you ask yeah. with like, you're going to believe your, your answer already yeah. and you still the, exactly. won't, then that's different. Yeah. If yeah. you choose to live in an abundance yeah. um, and you realize there are so much out there for yeah. you, that you don't need everything, you yeah. don't need everybody, just find the, the place for you, yeah. then you you thrive not only in whatever you choose to do, yeah. but like also in the way that you carry yourself and the yeah. way that you live your life. It took me a while to understand, you know, like um, that your friends from, let's say, childhood or old friends, you know, some of them may not stick around. Were you prepared that um, you might lose some of your friends. People just became distant, but they didn't ask me about it. Yeah. And I was too shy to talk about so, it. So it. we just pretended like it wasn't there. Yeah. If what you know about hijab and Muslim women yeah. is what you see in the media, yeah. and that's your perception, mm. then I would be terrified of it too. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I would not agree with yeah. it because of the way that it's presented. Yeah. What was the decision for you to go to Fox? I think it's my responsibility and just anybody who has a platform's responsibility um, to Put yourself in spaces that are not comfortable for you or uh -huh. that have not welcomed you before. Mm -hmm. In 2016, Playboy <laughs> profiled yes. me I was about as, to get, yeah. yeah. So 2016, they were doing no nudity and they had a Renegades issue. It was their first Renegades issue. So they did, I think it was like six Renegades in different industries. So for journalism, they chose to profile me as a Renegade and they talked about my work. Yeah, and it was, I, it was an incredible experience, uh -huh. but it turned the world on its head and people could not stop talking about it because it was, it was the first time mm -hmm. there was ever a Muslim woman with a hijab in Playboy. Yeah. And I had people who were extremely supportive. And then I also had people who were like, how could you, you do, do something the, yeah. like this? But to me, I'm like, my message is clear 110%. I've never wavered from it. Yeah. It's my truth. Yeah. Why am I going to continuously only go on platforms yeah. that already know what I'm saying and already it, understand so, it? Yeah. Because I can't tell you how many tens of thousands of people reached out to me after that saying, wow, I've never heard yeah. this from a Muslim woman before. Yeah. I've never heard something like this before. And to me, I, I, my act of service in my own like way of thinking in life is to be able to put myself in places that are uncomfortable because I know my truth. For me, I got the opportunity to do that. And I, I mean, I definitely asked mentors and I asked people um, what they would do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like it ended up as crazy as everything turned out. I'm really proud of being able to put myself in places that haven't welcomed me before. Hats off to you for doing that. Thanks. You know, that's really <laughs> inspiring. Besides the strength of it, like what is it that you want the world to when they see you, mm. when they look at you, when they hear you? What do you want people to walk away and get, get out of it? It's such an interesting question because I was having a conversation with my mom a couple of days ago about the hijab and how obsessed people are with it and how uncomfortable they get mm -hmm. with it. And I don't think it's just the hijab. I think we are just obsessed with what women choose to do with their bodies mm -hmm. and how they choose to dress. <laughs> when I was course, yeah. working on Sold in America, one of the sex workers I was talking to told me that she had written an article about how she related more to Muslim women than anyone else uh -huh. because of how obsessed society was with the way that we carried ourselves and dressed. Yeah. When I was in Paris years ago, I went on their biggest talk show on television and I talked about, because there's a lot of laws against the hijab yeah. in France, yeah. and I talked about, like, I don't care if somebody walks out butt naked or completely covered, I don't think that the government should be able to tell women want, how to dress, I, I and I didn't realize how controversial that was because it created such a stir there and that was just my truth hijab is so personal that yes you can see this but you will never know exactly why i wear it or exactly why she wears yeah. it because it might it's probably two different reasons and then you don't know like how direct of a connection this is to my faith and my belief in yeah. living for something bigger than myself and i want to be able to walk into rooms and then when i walk out forget my name forget my face forget what mm -hmm. like who i am but don't forget the message. The whole point of this, to me, is a reminder that like I wake up every day and I get to say like I live for something that's way bigger than myself. Yeah. And even if like on the surface, it makes people uncomfortable or yeah. it like is misunderstood, that there's still a message that like I want to yeah. penetrate your heart with. And to me, that's more important than anything. I know that I'm doing this 
for everybody who fought before me yeah. to make it easier for me today to even be sitting in this chair yeah. and everybody who's going to come after me mm -hmm. to make it so that like one day there will be other women on TV wearing a hijab and no one's going to even think twice about yeah. it. I spoke in uh, Reno, Nevada last week and there was a, a girl who came up to me. She was wearing a hijab. She drove hours to be there and she was like in tears. And when I saw her, I was like, wow, like this, I like feel like I'm looking at myself. Yeah. I could tell like she'd been yeah. following me, her style, the way she wrapped it, yeah. her makeup, everything. And she was like shaking, crying. And she was like, I never thought uh, that this yeah. is something that I could do. And I'm, I'm literally studying journalism because I saw that you could do it so that I can oh. too. And then the door is finally open for mm -hmm. me. And I don't think about it like mm -hmm. that because like I, I always say like people like Oprah and Lisa Ling and Christiana Amanpour and Sold Out O'Brien, all of these women like made it easier for me. Yeah. Your story deeply resonates with me because growing up, um, you know, um, oftentimes, especially when, when you're interested in fashion and all this like in style and fabulous stuff there, you, you start to equate your worth with what is being published or whether it's in magazines oh, or on the yeah. cover and all that stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. And so all of a sudden you turn page and you see no one that looks like you. Subconsciously you start believing that your worth is someone not as much as that white person's right. who's on the cover of a magazine. And so for me personally, when this crazy rich Asians happened, I called up all my other um, designer friends and you know, like everyone, uh, all the Asians, and I said, listen, this is the first time we're being represented in a way that we are desired, we are desirable, you know, we have similar ones and uh, the narrative is similar to like what has always been allocated to a white person. I cried in yeah. Crazy Rich Asians because like even though I'm not Asian, I was like, oh my God, like this is so revolutionary. Like this kind of representation, yeah. it, I've never, I felt it. My friend Rami has a show called Rami on Hulu now yeah. and it's like a representation of a Muslim American Arab experience. And I was in tears when I first watched mm. the show and I told him, I was like, I didn't know that this is what representation felt like. Mm -hmm. And you don't know because yeah. it. it's missing. Yeah. You don't know that that's what you needed. Yeah. And I, I remember feeling like, oh my gosh, is this exposing like my life? Like, is this what this, is this what representation feels like? And it was like, really, mm -hmm. it was so surreal. And you realize like when you become that person, especially as a public figure, I always say like, I want to be the person I wish I would have had when I was 12. And my <laughs> sister is 13. And I've always like one of my sister, my youngest sister, and I always keep my younger siblings in mind because I'm like, I want them to see like what the, what mm -hmm. I had missing. We're in this time now we are being celebrated, right. you know, which I feel in so many ways, it is the greatest thing that's happened to us. But in so many ways, it's also time for us to be a little more vigilant. We have to understand the power and in true inclusion. Yeah. Why do you want your decision-making table to all look the same, think the same, and walk yeah. the same? No matter how diverse your campaign is, it reads inauthentic. Yeah, 100%. And if you are a part of a minority community, you can see through that. Nope. Now that social media is, is, is something that is a part of pushing culture forward, mm -hmm. people get to choose where they're loyal, who they support, yeah. how they spend their yeah. dollars, yeah. and where they want to stand by. Yeah. And now it's not enough for a company to just have diversity in a campaign because if you aren't standing for something, if you aren't firm in the way that you carry yourself, mm -hmm. people sniff it out. I mean, we have the power now to garner audiences on our own. You don't yep. need to be in a magazine. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to have certain type like press in your traditional form, mm -hmm. you just need to be with the people. Yeah. And the people know what's real. The culture is moving in one direction and it's if you want to continue to maintain a certain legacy, then you need to be on the front lines of that cult like the, of that push. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, then you're gonna fall behind. Talking about uh, magazines, I just wanted to um, have a conversation about that misidentification yeah. and the misrepresentation of uh, you in pages of Vogue. How did you feel? Mm. Uh, what What did that particular moment mean before you realized it wasn't, you know, that you were misidentified? We got the inquiry the day, I, the first day I moved to New York. So I was like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. meant to be. Like, this is wild. I mean, I've been reading Vogue since I was a child. Yes. It was such an honor, and it was something that I really, like, was so excited for. But I know misidentification is more common than not for me. And not just because it's me, just in general. So <laughs> me, me too, when too, it happens, yes. yeah, yeah, when it happens, like, I, 
I know how to like try to prevent it. So what I was disappointed was with was that we had reached out a couple of times beforehand to ask to fact check because I knew that people usually spell my name wrong oh, or do God. something. We hadn't gotten a response. And so when we went to the airport that day and I found the magazine, Adam, my husband took a video of it because we were gonna send it to my family. Yeah. That's like, I was not intending to send that to anybody. And then I opened it and we were, I was so excited. And then I read the caption and I thought that they spelled my last name wrong. But I was like, it's so wrong though. And I started like, I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe this happened. Yeah. But to be completely honest with you, I wasn't surprised. I was just really upset. They called me an actor and a model yeah. who I mean, was from yeah, Pakistan. Yeah. Like, and it was completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I wouldn't blame the person who typed it in. I just blame the system that exists in which like we can't invest enough yeah. and we don't care as much especially when it comes to minorities yeah. people weren't upset because it happened directly to me essentially it was because everybody saw themselves they yeah. were like this would happen to me too this yeah. would happen to me too and they realized that like more often than not you are there to check off a box yeah. and that is where that conversation of true <laughs> inclusion comes in Absolutely. how many times yep. are you actually represented i also recognize that tokenism and being a, bo a box to check off is almost a requirement for you to get to the place where you can have a seat at the table. One, yeah. Which is why the journey, as gutting as it is, is necessary so that you can be there to open the door for the people who are coming. You're doing incredible stuff. You're inspiring us. You're, uh, you know, you're out there. You're talking about it. You do need a moment off. You, yeah. know, you need time off, right? <laughs> so what or who allows you to be at a place where you're in your center and mm. calm? I'm really lucky that my husband's family and my family are just a few hours away. So my like recharge, I realized this this past weekend because I was with my family, is like spending time with my siblings and my yeah. parents. And yeah. My family has a foundation called ICU. We mm. work to alleviate homelessness. And this past weekend, we made like over 500 packages for people experiencing homelessness and passed, oh, wow. and passed them out. And I think just being there and being a part of that process and spending time with people who have different experiences is like what centers me. Mm. And it's funny that you said that because I used that word this past weekend where I was just like, wow, I feel centered, I needed yeah. this. But besides that, I mean, I love taking baths and <laughs> eating really great food and hang and like just laughing yeah. really hard. Yeah. So like in the darkest times, like when I was filming Sold in America, the only thing I could watch on television was like cartoons. Yeah. Like, a, uh, like no, Rick, Rick and Morty and yeah. Bob's Burgers, like, <laughs> and you just have to figure out a way to unplug because you can't give from an empty cup. Amazing, Bollywood karaoke is like my my way of like oh, distressing. My, it. I do okay. karaoke, but I've never done Bollywood. Well, oh, no, you, well, I have one at home. We, we must do it, okay? And then That's the so other funny. thing is like the process of getting ready. You know, Ooh. like is for me has been like I take time in the bathroom, like you know, just like even when I'm like you know done. For, end of the night, you know, like I'm like by myself, even if it's like five minutes or half an hour, wh however long it takes, I really enjoy that time. I also just don't feel like that, like that deep yeah. breath until like I have yeah. everything well, like taken care of. And yeah. it is a process. Yeah. I try, yeah, I mean, I, my skincare routine is so important to me and I just love feel like What What is it like? Hydration. Tell me, tell me, what is that? Oh my gosh, yeah. I think I'm, I'm like not as, particular as a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. I just try different things. Uh, Dr. Barbara Strum like sent me a yeah. bunch of stuff and I'm like, oh my God, your stuff is amazing. So I like literally do her whole process. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll like use a roller. I'll put like oh, yeah. a mask on her. Just <laughs> I love it. Don't you love it? Yeah. I oh, like yeah. candles. I play music. Yeah. I take baths, like, which is like, oh, that's so funny and cute or whatever, but it's, it's intentionality. Whether it, you know, your skin looks extra great or not, it doesn't matter to me. It's like the very fact that a, You've taken time for yourself. A hundred percent. You know, it is like you're nurturing it's a process, yourself. You're yeah. nurturing yourself. You're yeah. saying, guess what? Me first. When you're taking care of yourself, that's the only way you can take care of others. Exactly. You know, so and that's like, like where the disconnect is. So I always believe like you have to be of service to yourself yeah. if you want to be of service to other people. And you yeah. have to be able to take care of yourself. And there is like yeah, but it's hard to find that balance. Like I remember I, I'm somebody who internalizes a lot. I take in a lot of people's emotions. Like if someone's hurting, I will feel that like and so when filming, like spending two years filming something that was like really hard to internalize, 
I had to find like a way to be okay for myself because there is um, like secondary trauma where you're taking in things that even if you didn't experience them and then there's this guilt where they're like, oh, I didn't even go through that. So yeah. why am I feeling no. bad? Like, you know, you have to find that balance and then figure out what way am I going to be able to be my best self when I show yeah. up tomorrow. Who could be your icon? Whether it's beauty, whether it's who are your icons? Who do you look up to? Well, one person that I think has been doing an exemplary job of leadership is the Prime Minister of New Zealand who oh my God, yes. like really came through and brought an entire community together that like couldn't be further from like relating to the situation mm -hmm. through humanity, compassion, and like true love and understanding. She like approached the Muslim community after the terrorist attack with like yeah. such deep compassion and when she cried, the entire country yeah. cried with her. And I thought that that was one of the most beautiful things um, but like my personal icons are like people in history, even in just Islamic history. So like one of the um, women in Islam is Khadija, who was married to the Prophet peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. And she was a businesswoman. She was one of the most successful business people and one of the most educated people. And she was a leader and in so much in power. And I, I, I take a lot of inspiration from like people that I grew up learning about. Mm. Um, and I always think that it's interesting because this notion, especially like this representation of like Muslim women are oppressed is so like staggering because yeah. that's nothing of my yeah. experience. And yes, people around the world have different experiences because of culture, but there's also a differentiation between culture and religion. Mm -hmm. But in my religion, I was taught like you had to be educated. You had to learn how to do things for yourself. Mm -hmm. You had to know how to drive. You had to know how to defend yourself. You okay. had to know how to speak. And you had to be able to walk into spaces and recognize like what you had to say mattered more than anything else. And this and is in your religion. This is in my faith, yeah. Okay, well. My faith is literally rooted in service and compassion. Yeah. You do for others and you are kind to people and that's it. I want to start with that because that particular, what you just said that, you know, in itself is breaking down so many myths that's associated with someone who looks like you, let's say. Yeah. You know? And the Just ask. Yeah. No, <laughs> it, no it's, that's the truth. And yeah. the, the biggest lesson that we can take away from is like, don't be afraid to ask. Look are at you. Know? Are you going to be a journalist no, now? No, 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 no. That, that, I'll leave it up to you. <laughs>